Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Peter Coldrake. I'm the Chief Commissioner of TEXA, and I would like to welcome you all to um, this 2023 um, conference. Uh, all 800 delegates in person and an another couple of hundred who are joining us online, including quite a number from New Zealand. Uh, I would like to begin uh, proceedings by acknowledging the, that we are meeting on the traditional lands of the peoples of the Kulin Nation. Uh, we acknowledge the important role that First Nations people play um, in the life and the work and the, and the contribution they make to the fibre and culture of all of our organisations. And in particular, I recognise the leadership of First Nations people, both those present as well as those they follow and those who are still emerging. Uh, it's a special ple pleasure today to welcome the Federal Minister for Education, Jason Clare, uh, and I'll formally welcome uh, the Minister tomorrow, this morning. Tomorrow, tomorrow though, is his 16th birthday as a politician in Parliament. Um, he, he might be tempted by that and say something. Um, I would like to um, pay a particular acknowledgement of the, uh, of the uh, attendance today uh, of the students. Student participation in TEXA conferences has been important for a number of years, I think since we started doing these, um, and, we, and we like to feature and involve students in all the proceedings and, uh, and in all the panels, and I think we've just about achieved that today. Um, the theme of the conference for this year is, as you know, reshaping higher education. Um, that, that, I think, is a very relevant um, topic, very relevant theme, given the backdrop that is provided um, by, by the Accord process, the Accord review, uh, which is going on this year. And I hope that the proceedings today and those that occurred yesterday in the, in the workshop sessions do justice to that theme and our seriousness in seeking to, uh, to ad address it. Uh, I think a number of you will have heard, if you weren't here yesterday, will have heard about those sessions, uh, particularly uh, the first session, which was about rethinking assessment in the age of AI and the quite therapeutic effect of some of those presentations. Uh, obviously, we're focused on the quality and integrity of the sector, I'm particularly interested in uh, the well-being of students in all the dimensions of, of that well-being. Uh, and I think in more general terms, the conference theme reflects Texas' dual mission to do what it can to uphold and protect the quality and integrity of the system as well as the interests um, of, of students in the, in the system. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the Honourable Jay Sinclair, the Minister for Education, uh, who I've just uh, in indicated has been in politics for quite a long time has been a minister uh, in the prior Labor government before his appointment as Minister for Education in the current government. Um, we in higher education have a bit of a tendency to think that it's all about us. Um, if you're looking at, at the portfolio from uh, Jason Clare's perspective, he's dealing with at least three major national reviews that are going on right now. Not only that which is uh, going on with higher education, but also in the school space, and in the early childhood space. And that, of course, doesn't um, include all the other cross-government major initiatives that are going on, which affect trades and schools, which affect immigration and visas and all manner of those things. So he's got an awful lot um, on, on his plate. Uh, we greatly, uh, we greatly uh, support the very direct and keen interest he's taken in this review. His establishment of a ministerial reference group to support the activity, his engagement with the process more generally. I recall in particular earlier in the year, and he said it a couple of times, that he really welcomed spiky ideas. Uh, that's an interesting term. Uh, I'm sure he's had plenty of them um, come, come through. And the process of the Accord, as you know, is coming uh, more toward its end than its beginning. Um, and uh, he'll say much more about that in the remarks that, uh, in the remarks he makes. But Minister, we greatly appreciate your interest um, in our work, your, your keen and personal interest in the sector, 
Uh, we know that some of your interest, at least, is informed by your own experience and journey, and that is as it should be, and we welcome you here to our conference. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks, Peter. Thanks for making me feel so old. Um, and thanks for everyone being here. More than 800, is that right? Including a lot online people representing our universities and our private higher education providers, and most importantly, our students. How many again, Peter? Over 100 and about 135 students. Uh, that's good. That's a good thing. That helps fill me with hope and optimism that this is a conference that is not just about what's happening now, but what we want to achieve in the future. And I particularly want to recognise Taylor, who is going to be on the panel that's after me, but I suspect will be a lot more exciting and interesting than me. Uh, but Taylor Roberts uh, at Flinders University, a medical student at Flinders University, is part of the ministerial reference group that I've convened to help to shape and influence the Accord process. It's great to see you here today, Taylor. And, and, and Bailey Roberts from NUS is going to be part of a panel as well. And Bailey uh, has been fantastic in helping to be part of that process as well. So if you've got 135 students part of this, Peter, that fills me with optimism and confidence that you've got the right people in the room to make a difference. Can I start also by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And can I acknowledge you, Peter, the Chief Commissioner of Texa, and genuinely thank you for your wisdom and for your advice in my first 18 months in this job. I really do appreciate it. I also want to acknowledge the acting CEO of Texa, Dr Mary Russell, and thank you, Mary, for the important, often difficult, work that you do. We have some of the best universities and other higher education providers in the world. The rankings, the research, the people we produce are proof of that. But good universities and good higher education providers are not just about rankings. They can't just be about rankings. They have to be about students. And they can't be places of privilege. They've got to be places of opportunity. And while universities are autonomous and self-governing, how they are governed has a real impact not just on them and their staff and their students, but on our whole country. And that's why the role that TEXA plays, the work that TEXA does, is so crucial. Why effective regulation and quality assurance is so important. And why this conference is important bringing all of us together to share ideas and talk about all of the big issues that confront us. And I can see from yesterday's program and today's, and you made that point again, Peter, one of those is AI. And I want to thank the team at Texa for the work they're doing here, particularly around how what students learn and understand is assessed in the age of generative AI. I needed AI to help write that part of the speech. Most of us, or maybe all of us except the students that are here, can remember people knocking on our door when we were kids trying to flog us Encyclopaedia Britannica. OK, I can see a few nods. Doesn't happen anymore. All that went the way of the dodo when the internet arrived. And this AI is just as disruptive a force. Just like the pandemic forced us to rethink the way that we learn, this is requiring us to rethink the way that we assess what you teach. But it's bigger than that. This has the potential to transform the way we work. In fact, I think it's a given that it will transform the way we work, the way each and every profession works. And that means it affects the way you train and prepare people for those professions where people will work. That's what makes coming to grips with this so important. Another thing that's obvious looking at the program is the focus on reform. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. 
I said a moment ago that good universities, good higher education providers aren't just about rankings or that they can't just be about rankings. They've got to be about students. And there's nothing more important than their safety. That's why in the wake of the events on October 7, I wrote to every university asking what steps they were taking to keep students safe. And why from the very first speech I made as Minister for Education, I talked about the scourge of sexual violence and sexual harassment and what we have to do about it. And I know that this is not just a problem in our universities. Of course it's not. It's in our homes, it's in our workplaces, it's in our parliament. But wherever it is, we have to confront it. And the fact is universities aren't just places where people work or study, they are more often than not places where people live. And the Accord team called this out in their interim report as an area where they said urgent work is needed. Since then, a lot has happened. A working group led by my department and made up of representatives of every state and territory has been set up. That working group also includes Paddy Kinnersley, the CEO of Our Watch, an expert in the prevention of violence against women. They have been working with universities, with student leaders and with survivor advocates like End Rape on Campus, Stop and Fair Agenda. On Tuesday this week, education ministers around the country were briefed by Ms Kinnersley and some of those advocates. And yesterday we released the working group's draft action plan. It includes a proposal to establish an independent national student ombudsman. The draft action plan sets out the sort of investigation and dispute resolution powers that the ombudsman could have. And they include the authority to consider whether the decisions and actions taken by providers are wrong, unjust, unlawful, discriminatory or unfair. The ability to respond to a complaint while a provider is still considering the issue if, in the Ombudsman's view, the provider is not proceeding with sufficient focus and energy. The power to recommend that the Vice-Chancellor, Chief Executive or Leader of a provider takes specific administrative steps and the capacity to offer a restorative engagement process between the student and the provider. It also suggests an annual report to Parliament that will report on the numbers and types of complaints and the actions of providers in response to recommendations. The next step is broader consultation on this draft design to get to detailed design, and that'll take place over the next few weeks. Change is coming. I want to thank Universities Australia for the Charter on Sexual Harm that they released last week. I want to thank TEXA who have backed this idea of an independent student ombudsman. But most importantly, I want to thank the brave young women who have fought for this for years and years. The truth is they are the change makers. Next week, we'll also see another change that is long overdue. Next week, I intend to introduce legislation to reform the Australian Research Council. I'm sure many of you are all too familiar with the political interference, the ministerial vetoes and delays that have undermined the independence of the ARC in the last decade. But this also has to change. I want to get the politics and the politicians out of it. That's why I asked Professor Margaret Shield to lead the first review of the ARC Act in 20 years. Margaret led this work with Professor Susan Dodds and Professor Mark Hutchinson, and they handed me their report earlier this year. It recommends the establishment of an independent ARC board that, instead of the minister, will be responsible for the approval of grants within the National Competitive Grants Program. The minister will be responsible for setting the grant guidelines, but to make sure that this power isn't misused, these guidelines will be a disallowable legislative instrument. This means any future minister who tries to use the ARC as their own political plaything will be subject to the scrutiny of the parliament. After me, I can see on the program, as I touched on a moment ago, apart from Taylor, we've got Mary and a whole team talking about the university's accord. 
and I don't want to steal Professor O'Kane's thunder, but I just want to make a couple of important points as we all await the final report with bated breath. First, thank you, Mary. The drive and the passion that you've applied to this task has been extraordinary. I am so glad that you said yes to this Herculean task. And second, I want to thank everyone who has been part of this. Everyone who has turned up to a meeting, written an op-ed or an article, made a speech, made a submission, or given me a piece of your mind. Every compliment, every criticism matters. This is the biggest and broadest review of higher education in 15 years. But as Peter alluded to a moment ago, it's bigger than that. It's not just that. This is one part of a bigger piece of work. And it will only work if we make the reforms that we need to make in school education and before that in early education. That's why there are big reviews going on in those areas as well, all at the same time. Think about them as three carriages in the one train, all interconnected, all part of getting us to one destination. The Productivity Commission will release its draft report on early education tomorrow, and we will get their final report in the middle of next year. The review into school education, led by Dr Lisa O'Brien, will be considered by education ministers as we work together next year to strike a deal to finish the work that David Gonski started over a decade ago, to get all schools, finally, to their full and fair funding level. And at the end of this year, I will also receive the Accord team's final report. Together, they will form a blueprint for a better and a fairer education system for the next decade and beyond. Right now, we're implementing all the recommendations of the Accord's interim report. That includes doubling the number of university study hubs, abolishing the despised 50 per cent pass rule, and the extension of the demand-driven system to all Indigenous students, whether they live in the regions or in our cities. Some of the ideas that were floated in the interim report have also been picked up in the employment white paper that the Treasurer released a few weeks ago. That includes scoping the idea of a national skills passport and work to consider how paid placements, something to deal with this issue of placement poverty, that's been brought up time and again in the Accord process could work for teaching students, for nursing students, social work students. That work is happening right now. I've also given the Accord team another job to do. Education ministers recently agreed that we want the Accord team to give us their advice on the issue of early university offers. At the moment, there are different rules in different parts of the country. Some people love them, some people hate them. Some teachers say it causes students to take their foot off the pedal. Some universities tell me they're worried about other universities poaching their best and brightest. Education ministers have told me that they want a standard national approach. So expect to see something about that in the final report. As many of you have heard me say before, we can't do everything and we can't fund everything. That's just a fact. There are always going to be more good ideas than there is money to fund them. And inevitably, in the months to come, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. That's why I've asked Mary and the Accord team to think about how reform could or should be prioritised or staged and to develop a plan that's not just about one budget but that can be implemented over the course of the next decade and beyond. Something that will take time to implement, but something that will also outlast us, all of us. Lasting reform that will help set us up with the skills that we need for the future, that will help to break down some of those artificial entrenched barriers that have been cemented in over the decades between vocational education and higher education, that will help to make sure that we've got a higher education system that is more focused on students than rankings, and most importantly, 
that will give more Australians a crack at university, to take us closer to that country where your chances in life don't depend on who your parents are, where you live or the colour of your skin. The sort of thing that only a better and a fairer education system can make real. That's the opportunity that I want us to grasp. and That's the long-term plan that we have a chance to build together and to start to implement together next year. Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much, Minister, for setting the scene for, uh, for today, um, for your interest, um, your leadership, obviously. Um, particularly helpful, the remarks you've made about student wellbeing and the, and the focus there and the responsibility that we all have in that area, uh, the initiative of the National Student Ombudsman. Um, the comments you made, too, about the personal responsibilities of leaders um, in institutions in progressing some of these issues, particularly the intractable ones, and of course for what you've said about the accord, and we all um, look forward to the receipt of that report and the government's response to it. So thank you very much, Minister. <clears throat> so we're just going to set up for uh, a minute um, the, uh, the next session. So uh, I'll be joined by our speakers. Thanks. It seems a little absurd to introduce someone who may not be on the screen, so let me start um, with our uh, other speakers. The order of the proceeding will be that Mary will speak first um, about the accord, um, and then uh, there will be a conversation uh, involving Taylor Roberts, who's obviously on the stage. Um, and I'd like, when Taylor speaks, I'm sure she will, to tell a little bit of her own journey um, as a young woman from Streaky Bay, which she, which she tells us is 700 kilometres uh, to the west of Adelaide, and how she came, therefore, as a rural student to be ultimately studying medicine uh, at Flinders. Uh, and David Perry, who's the Vice President of Alpha Crucius, uh, Chair of one of our peak bodies of the Independent Higher Education Association. He's also been a member of the Standards Panel. Um, and our first speaker is Mary O'Kane. I can't see anyone to know from whom I should be getting advice. Is Mary coming on? Um, so it's just past 10 and Mary has uh, joined us and uh, we warmly welcome you um, to the Texas Conference, Mary. To give you some idea of context, we've just had uh, Minister Claire um, in the room in the last half hour speaking uh, with us. We've got about um, 800 people in the room and another 190 odd who are joining us um, online. Uh, and uh, this is the second day of our proceedings yesterday being devoted to a series of workshops which are very uh, well intended, uh, well attended um, on topics, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, on, on topics ranging from AI across to student wellbeing and so on. Um, this session now uh, provides the opportunity to hear from our panel. Uh, your colleagues, Mary, I've already introduced. In terms of Mary, she hardly needs an introduction. She's a very distinguished uh, Australian um, thinker, uh, academic, educator, uh, and engineer, having been a vice chancellor, uh, a chief scientist and engineer, having r had a range of commissions um, during, her professional, um, during her professional life, and uh, Minister Clare making um, clear um, his, his uh, uh, pleasure that Mary accepted the commission of this uh, Herculean task, as he described it. Um, I'm, I think we might open with, uh, and I've given Mary a clue on this, with Mary um, talking about the accord, not just in terms of the bits and pieces of the process um, and some of the issues, but I think to reflect as it comes to its end on some of the things she's learnt, because in these processes that is a, a crucial part of the exercise. So I think to start the proceedings we'll ask Mary to make some reflections, um, and then David, uh, I think, I'm not sure who, but we'll work that out. We'll go to some questions of Mary and amongst ourselves and hopefully have a little time for, for, um, for discussion toward the end uh, with the audience. So, Mary, thank you very much, and over to you. Thank you, and 
Peter, thank you very much for those kind remarks. And can I say to the everybody present, I'm really sorry I can't be with you. I've just come out of chairing the Accord panel as we worked to the very end of the activities, so we thought it was better that we stay fixed in place to do that and join you remotely. I was also sorry I re really couldn't be with you yesterday too, because there's a one thing that Peter didn't mention, I might be an engineer, but I'm a computer engineer and my field is artificial intelligence, and it's wonderful to see it finally being used. This is talking about using university research uh, all these decades on, it's it's great to see it being picked up. And I know there's worries about it, but it also um, has a lot to give, we, we from that field believe. Um, I wanted to talk, Peter, in discussing with Peter what I should discuss, he's mentioned that it's reflections on the accord, but it's with a personal lens on it, that I left the higher education sector in 2001. And while I was very involved in it, when I was the New South Wales Chief Scientist and Engineer, and in many of my roles through my company, I do a lot of work with universities. Um, I hadn't been as immersed in it as I had for this review. And so I thought I'd talk about, I'd steal something from Hilaire Belloc, the famous um, essayist and protagonist, literary protagonist. He had a book very much dealing with the um, criticisms of the Catholic Church with, with the wonderful title, Survivals and New Arrivals. And this is what I wanted to sort of steal that title for what I want to say today. I want to talk about things that haven't changed, things that have changed since I left, things that haven't changed, and things that I can't work out if they changed or not. And I, so I'm not going to talk directly on the review, maybe a little couple of references, but you'll be able to infer various things about the review from what I say. So first of all, things that have changed. One thing that's changed um, and people are very supportive of is having a regulator. So having TEXA is one of the great changes that came through post the Bradley review. And while some people like to criticise it on occasion, the very fact that there is a regulator in the system I think is seen as a universally seen as a good thing, um, including from the international side. Other things that have changed, the institutions have got very big. As Glenn Davis, the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, often points out, Australia has some of the biggest universities in the world. And I've been amazed at how they've grown over that period. Um, the number of private providers has got very large. And while they maybe don't cover a large percentage of the total students, it's interesting to see how many there are. There's a small number of new universities, Federation, Avondale, Torrens, but not a lot. Um, a great thing that we have particularly noticed was, is the regional university study hubs um, and the now the suburban university study hubs that the Minister announced following our recommendation in the interim report. That seems to be one of the uh, interesting innovations in the way we do edu higher education provision and clearly is meeting a real need in uh, places where people weren't going to university. The number of international students, of course, has grown enormously in the 22, 23 years since I've been away from the sector and has had such a, an impact on the sector in terms of both the composition of the student body, um, activities being done outside Australia, and of course the money that comes in with it and all the interesting social dynamic that goes, goes with it. The demand-driven system was a very interesting experiment that certainly increased the numbers in, in higher ed, moved us more and more to mass, towards mass higher education, but also brought in equity goods. Just the, um, the growth that we've seen, we continued to grow very fast post Dawkins and on in the last 20 odd years, it, it's really interesting to, to see the size of the system has grown. Research, and um, it's amazing to, particularly to look at the research expenditure statistics for Australian universities, the fact that Australian universities spend $12 billion per annum at the moment on uh, over $12 billion on research, and that they um, do about 36% of Australia, account for about 36% of Australia's expenditure on R&D is amazing. That, is, that the higher education sector is such a contributor to our national research endeavour. Um, 
compared to other OECD countries. Research training is another area that's changed. I, when I left the sector, there was a distinct move to a lot more PhD coursework and a distinct move to professional doctorates. The emphasis on both of those has decreased in recent times. They're still there, but not as much. A couple of big changes in South Australia and Western Australia. South Australia has announced the new universe, the new Adelaide University. I'm just pleased I provided the stationery, which I did before I left Adelaide, and it's all ready to be pulled out of the drawer and used. Um, and Western Australia will be interesting to see where things land there. There's some interesting new styles of institutions in the vet higher ed sector. So, for example, in New South Wales, the Institutes of Applied Technology um, have been very successful. The IAT Digital of Meadowbank or IAT Construction of Kingswood, joint ventures, but they are between universities and, and TAFEs in New South Wales. There's been a lot of use of marginal funding in the system, and the review has seen some of the negative aspects of, of that. And I think, and we believe that's very closely related to the question of very big universities. Um, I mentioned that with the demand-driven system, there was a boost in equity numbers, but the boost hasn't been as great as you might hope. Um, students are very much struggling to afford things. That's been quite a, a, a worrying issue, as I've seen just how people are struggling for rent and food, and that's very, very concerning. There's a lot of concern about regulatory burden on university administration. Some universities look very run down. And in an industrial sense, the importance of the 40-40-20 split. So there's some things that have distinctly changed in my period away, and there are some very big changes in that. A few things that haven't changed. The student leaders are just great, and so I'd like to do a shout out to the student national student leaders. And Taylor, you're one of them. It's been wonderful working with all of you um, over the over this year. The staff in universities are still very keen on what they do. It's wonderful to see the passion for the work, even if morale at various times is is relatively low on wider things. People still like being academics and doing the job. Um, this people still talk about the higher education system as a market as opposed to a, a more of a centrally controlled system with market elements. That, that hasn't changed while I've been away. There's still, the Commonwealth Government still hands out a lot of funding pots on top of the main uh, Commonwealth supported places. And universities still fight over, ferociously, over incredibly small amounts of money, not worrying too much about the, the effort involved and the return on the effort. The equity underrepresentation. It's improved, but it's still got a long way to go. And that's been one of the big challenges we're trying to meet in what we recommend in the review. Recognition of prior learning has not moved well. There's still a lot to be done in that regard to make the system much more nimble and make it easier for a student to get through. I'm amazed to still be able to see the relative funding model in the sector. When you look at the relative, the notional costs in the Deloitte study, um, when you look at um, how universities giving out their money, that one-off adjustment of about 1988 or 89 that was done as part of the Dawkins Review was only meant to be a one-off adjustment and is still reflected all these years later despite new technologies, new, new pedagogies, um, it hasn't changed. Parity of esteem sadly hasn't changed much. There's still a belief that some universities are better than others, that universities are better than VET and so on. We don't Unlike, say, Switzerland, where the different parts of the sectors are highly cross-respected by each other, we, we tend to have something of a hierarchy still in place. We Changing, there haven't been many new universities. In other countries, there's been, say, the US, there's been a lot of new universities. While I said we had a few, it's amazing we, we haven't had more. I mentioned that even though people like working in universities, morale doesn't seem to be terribly high. And there seems to be quite a deal of concern about the amount of administration that academics need to do. Um, one thing that I should have mentioned in the things that have changed, it's true that there's a lot fewer percentage of technical staff than there were, and a hollowing out effect where the, um, there's more senior and junior staff and a lot less middle staff. Um, 
there still was the strong pressure to commercialise. Um, there's still a relatively blind, uh, the system seems relatively blind to the growing research capacity of Asia, while there is quite a lot of joint research done. There's not a sort of strategic approach to the fact that Asia is going to be a research powerhouse and already is and is going to be even more so and are we ready for it is something of a question. Overall, um, another thing that hasn't changed is the perception of universities themselves. They're not by themselves, but by outside. I think they're still seen as something of an elitist system as opposed to something that absolutely everyone can aspire to. So that's my quick rundown of things that didn't change. So things have changed, things that didn't change. Let me, a couple of points where I don't know what the answer is. Um, it's clear that there's still pressure on the system to make sure its research is used. I talked about there's pressure to commercialise research, but there's also use. But there's also a lot of evidence to suggest a lot of university research is being used. And I often use New South Wales examples left over from my time as New South Wales uh, Chief Scientist and Engineer. When I think of the Australia as the leader in big robotics, in quantum, in not the leader in quantum computing, but a right up there in quantum computing, and how some of this is is deployed, the big robotics in the automatic minds, the work of Hugh Dallin White and his team, and the automated courts. Um, just looking at what the universities did in COVID and understanding COVID, there's, there's plenty, and you go on and on and on and on. So people say the academic research is not being used, but there's the evidence that maybe it is. So what's, what's the answer? And then a couple of things where I think we're not responding as well as we might be. Um, I mentioned the Asian, not, we're not sort of conscious of the, the growth of the Asian research powerhouse. It's one. Another area where I think we're underdoing things is with COVID, we put a lot of our educational activities online. Now that had to be done quickly and some of it wasn't perfect, but the opportunity of being a lot more online when we're a country at the end of the earth um, doesn't seem to be being picked up as, as much as it might be, that we've got lots of opportunity to be very, very creative using technologies, but using our own ingenuity to offer things online. That said, I want to do a real shout out to the Deputy Vice Chancellor's Academic. The, they Talking with them was always a joy through this review um, in terms of, as was talking to the other senior staff groups, but the Deputy Vice Chancellor's Academic clearly understand the online challenge. It's whether it's now sort of implementing it. The other thing is that generally, I think within the higher education sector and the tertiary sector, we're not um, responding to disruption as quickly as we might be. We did when it was COVID. When the chips are down, we clearly can do it, and big T. But anticipating disruption, I think we're weaker at. And um, so in sort of in summary as to where I am on things. I wrote an op-ed in January in The Australian where I said that the higher education system of Australia is actually very, very good and amazingly good. It is. This is what I still feel at the end of the year, but it does have some things to do. There are still uh, big improvements needed, particularly if we're going to deal with equity and we're going to deliver on the skills needs of the nation. And Peter, I'll leave it there. Hello. Thank you, Mary. Some, uh, some rich pickings there. Um, I think we'll open the batting with Taylor Roberts, um, whose uh, story in a very abbreviated way I referred to. Um, uh, Taylor also is a member of the Ministerial Reference Group, which I think the Minister might have referred to. And it'd be, it'd be good to perhaps open the batting with you, if I could use that metaphor, um, to just reflect on, on what you found with the review. You might want to pick up on some things that Mary has said, then I'll throw to David. Thanks, Taylor. No worries. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. My name's Taylor. I've been fortunate enough to be on the reference group this year on behalf of rural, regional and remote students. So, I'm from Streaky Bay in South Australia, which is an eight-hour drive west of Adelaide. Um, it's a very small coastal town, has about 1,500 people, so you guys are basically the population of Streaky in here, which is a little bit scary for me. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so I graduated from Streaky two years ago. Um, in my Year 12 cohort, I was one of eight students. Um, and I did three of my Year 12 subjects online through a program called Local Delivery. So that's collaborating with nearby schools. Um, this was super important for me and my pathway because I had to do the STEM subjects to get um, prerequisites to get into medicine. So without this, this would have pretty much prohibited me from being able to apply for uni from my rural town. Um, so obviously I got accepted into medicine at Flinders University. I have just finished my second year and it's been absolutely amazing. I'm hoping to become a rural GP down the track. Um, that could change, but that's the end goal. Um, and then this year and last year, I've been lucky enough to be a facilitator for a leadership program called Rural Youth Ambassadors. So Rural Youth Ambassadors is a program for um, country year 11 students that allows them to advocate for changes in their regional schools and develop their leadership skills as well. Um, and through this program, I've been connected with over 900 alumni across the country. So all country students who have been through school and then obviously either going to university or not. And I've consulted um, plenty of these students throughout my time in the Accord to get their experiences and ideas, what they would like to see in the Accord and try and represent as many different backgrounds as possible with my role there. So um, just to reflect on some of the things I've shared throughout the Accord and what I've learned from these consultations. So um, at lunch yesterday, I had one of the delegates from this um, meeting and she said to me, so Taylor, you're from the country. What's the biggest um, challenge that country students face when they're at university? And I said, well, it's not actually when they're at university, it comes before that. So I think the, one of the biggest problems is for students like myself is you can't be what you can't see. So we're not, we have a huge lack of exposure out in We don't know what opportunities there are, how many amazing careers that we could be chasing, um, but they're just not exposed to us out there. Um, another problem is we don't have access to the subjects we need. So like I said, I had to do a couple of my subjects online because my school didn't offer them and that's a huge problem for rural students. Um, and then an idea that I have uh, proposed during the Accord is the concept of journey mates. Ooh. It's um, linking young people to young people. So um, it's high school students linking them with someone who's in their ideal field or career and getting them to mentor them um, and basically be someone that they can talk to one on one about what they are aspiring to be. So for example, I've got a mentoring group for medical students um, from all across rural Australia and they're able to ask me questions like, oh Taylor, um, how do I enrol in my subjects or what subject should I do in year 12 to get into that pathway, that kind of thing. Um, and it's a little bit more opposed to um, when the unis come to your school and they try to um, sell their degrees and convince you to come to their uni. It's a little bit more personalised and you're able to make that connection. Um, and then once you've decided, right, well I've found my pathway, then the re cost of relocating to a metropolitan area to study is just enormous. Um, so yeah, the cost needs to be um, yeah, sorry guys, um, yeah, so an idea that um, I've proposed throughout the Accord is the idea of a relocation allowance. So obviously we have things like Centrelink that um, a lot of students can access um, to help them live. However, for country students, there's so many more additional costs because you're not living at home with your family. A lot of the time you'll be on placement or um, having to do some part-time work on top of your study. Um, and then once you're in uni, there's, um, I've come up with a concept such as growing your own workforce. So obviously there's a huge demand for things like doctors, teachers, nurses out in the country, but these students aren't able to actually get into these pathways. Even if they've identified, oh yes, I would love to be a teacher, 
sometimes getting into that pathway is the biggest challenge itself. So to meet these huge demands for skills and jobs in these regions, we need to make sure that these underrepresented groups, so the rural students, the First Nations, low SES and disability um, groups, they are able to access these pathways so then they, they can return to their local communities and fill those jobs because the demand, it, like, the demand's there and there's the kids that want to do it, but it's just so hard to get into those pathways. Um, and then, yeah, I just wanted to really um, reiterate the, how important it is to give youth a voice. Um, it's so important to have people that are living the reality of tertiary education coming to these things, making sure their voices are heard because without that, no changes would be made. And we're so fortunate we have people like Mary that are listening to us and taking on board these ideas because without her, yeah, there's not much is going to change. Um, I think that's all I had, if I wanted to throw to David. Thanks, David. There's some real gems there, Taylor. Yeah, thanks, Peter, and thanks, Taylor. Look, obviously, I'm wearing two hats today. One is as a leader at a, at a higher education provider, uh, Alpha Crucis, and then the second is as the chair of Independent Higher Education Australia. So I guess I have three main reflections on the accord process. Uh, the first is a, is a process reflection, and first of all, credit to Mary and her panel, who I think have made a really good effort to hear all stakeholders, to give everyone a voice in the process, which has been really important. In the independent space, we probably felt like we were playing catch up for a little while, where it was framed as the university's accord rather than the higher education accord, but I think we've, we've appreciated the efforts since then to, to bring us into the conversation. But the broader process question for me is how are we going to get from the, the brief for the accord process and, and how broad it was down to actually implementable practical, practical outcomes? And it's a concern I've heard around the sector. On the one hand, I think there's the appetite for reform where it's needed, but the risks, I think, are that either we end up with big ideas that have an impossibly long implementation time frame, or we end up just playing around the edges again and not actually bringing about uh, real reform. Uh, and so I guess that's a risk that exists. We all await eagerly the final report, but that's the process question for me. Even the interim report raised 80 areas, uh, policy areas for further consideration. That's a lot to deal with in one review, one final report. Um, so I might ask Mary about that in a moment. Uh, the second ref reflection is about what I think is the most likely outcome from the accord process, which seems to me at this stage to be the establishment of a tertiary education commission. We've heard quite a bit about that. I think that can be a good thing if the, if the focus is strategic uh, and if the Commission has the agency to tackle some of these really tricky policy problems, uh, what none of us need is another layer of bureaucracy or another reporting or oversight mechanism uh, or for other important reforms arising from the Accord review process to be delayed by the legislation and establishment of, of a TEC, and I think that's, that's at least a, p a possibility. I think the TEC would need to be reform-minded, it would need to be student-centric, and it would need to be representative of the whole sector. There's also the question of independence and how it might interact with all of the existing bodies that we have in higher education, TEXA being one, the department, the higher education standards panel, all of these other important bodies. So um, I think there's great potential there if it's a strategic body. And then my final reflection is perhaps more a hope or a plea. I know we've advocated for many years to government, to ministers, uh, for equitable funding for students. And for us that means, for example, the, the loan fee that inexplicably is paid only by students of independent providers or uh, equal access to things like Commonwealth supported places and other sorts of government funding. And the response from the government, at least for the last two years, has invariably been, well, the Accord will pick this up. <laughs> The Accord will review this and provide an outcome. So no pressure, Mary, um, but we're hoping <laughs> for something to come out of that process. Obviously, the interim report mentioned the idea of a universal learning entitlement, which we're really conceptualising as student-centred funding. And I think there just isn't yet much detail on what that might look like. But if the numbers about new students are even close to correct, the number of students we will need to train over the next however many decades 
then the whole sector, universities, independent providers, will need to play a key part in that. And I think on that basis, equitable funding for students is very necessary to make that happen. So I hope that question will be a key part of the final report. So lots of uh, um, challenge, I think, bringing practical outcomes from such a broad brief. But let's make sure if there is a TEC that it's strategic and visionary and able to get things done, then let's make sure there's equitable funding for students. So I've got a couple of questions out of that, but I'll defer to you, Peter. Um, thanks, David. Uh, well, there were some real gems in there from Paola, and I think Mary has heard most of those, setting out the really practical obstacles um, that vast numbers of people, uh, particularly in rural, remote, um, far-flung areas, uh, face. Um, and the practical nature of your advice more generally. David's thrown a couple of curly ones in the direction uh, of Mary. Um, Mary, it might be useful, I don't think it's giving away anything, if you, you might just talk to uh, the, the papers that went to um, the Ministerial Reference Group. One was relating to regulation and all that stuff, but uh, just to give a sense, because I think the challenge has been that, as David has said, a vast number of issues were raised in the interim report, which might in a different era be call, be, been called a green paper. Um, and of course, now we're heading toward uh, the final product. But in terms of reducing the many to a few, would you just like to say something about a few of the big, a few of the big issues um, that have um, detained you in the latter stages of the exercise? Sure, thank you, Peter. And thanks, Taylor, and thanks, David. They're, they're great comments. Um, I'm just sort of picking my way carefully through things here. But the general shape has not changed a lot since the interim report, in that there is a very big focus on skills and delivery of skills. And that means there's going to be enormous growth in the sector as that starts to kick in. Now, we've got soft growth at the moment. It might take a couple of years to start to really kick through. Um, but that, as well as meaning where are the students going to go and all those questions, are they going to be adequately funded? And we've certainly been facing that very head on to make sure that it was a funding process that, and make sure there was enough money to, to deal with this. But also there's going to, it, growth means that there's going to be a lot more academics needed and a lot more professional staff in universities needed and um, all the training that goes with that and the opportunities that go with it too for people. Um, the second big uh, message of the review is still the one on equity, and that's in some ways it's the underbeat of the whole thing and drives everything, is how we do get equity parity. And so how do we do, do make sure remote and regional students are represented in our universities at the same proportion, of, at least the same proportion as the population? How do we make sure low SES groups are there? And that group face head on again, because it's not often with some of those groups, the, the challenge of funding is greater than the challenge of funding students from um, sort of healthier backgrounds. Um, in terms of, uh, so, so I would say, David, the big changes are particularly there. And then the fact we're talking about a tertiary education commission in some form, is more about how we deal with it. And I think you spelled out brilliantly exactly what we have in mind, is something that is reform-minded, but we might steal your language. I'll go back and have a look at the chapter involved and see if I need to do a bit of, you know, um, plagiarism here. Um, and uh, make sure it does say reform-minded, strategic and independent. And that's certainly what we had in mind. And certainly, trying with such a commission is to support those big changes of growth and growth for skills through equity, but also to make sure that the regulatory burden lifts and the perception of the regulatory burden lifts. And But we still are more data-driven and more sort of fact-driven and we know more about the system. So, and then there's a whole research story um, and research training story, but Peter, maybe I should stop there so people can ask more questions and then I can come back in. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask David and Taylor if they'd like to follow up with any specific questions of Mary in a moment, but could I just telegraph that we'd like to provide the opportunity for members of the audience to make any particular comments or questions that you have. 
Um, could you please indicate with a raised hand or, or move to the aisle or something, otherwise uh, make yourselves known to people who are walking around with the mic so that after the, the um, comments and questions that are about to occur involving the panellists and Mary, there's an opportunity for you to have your say. I, I know people are sometimes reluctant to do that, but it's a, a really good opportunity. Um, Mary's here uh, with us, as it were, and um, you should feel very free and welcome to um, provide that comment. So David first, or Taylor, I don't know who wishes to go first. Mary, how would you envision the accord to empower all students to achieve their dreams, in particular the underrepresented cohorts? That's a, that's a great question. And what we would see is that we, particularly with the underrepresented cohorts, that as well as getting help, getting into university, we'd see that several things. One is that there's greater strength in helping build aspiration. So helping people understand they might like to go to university. So that's pre-university schools, wider community. We do see a strong emphasis on enabling how to help people get into university at the, and get to an appropriate level to, to get in. So what enabling courses should be offered? Are the schools doing the right thing? What do we do about subjects like you had to do um, with the particularly, say, STEM subjects that aren't offered or foreign language subjects that have to be done remotely? How do we make sure as part of the enabling to get into university that's offered and you're able to do it at really good levels? What do we do when people get into university? Is there enough support that we talk about as scaffolding so that groups who maybe come from underrepresented cohorts are given support at a the time when they often will drop out in the first year and beyond? And then how do we remove roadblocks? You heard me talk quite a bit about um, how students are struggling and how we've been startled by how people are struggling with rent and with food and with income. And so there's quite a few recommendations that go to removing those, those roadblocks. And so the dream is that there's enough support that every student will be able to um, get through, you know, not just get in, but get through, but also that they'll be able to earn while they learn, They'll have a, they won't have placement poverty, we sort of remove roadblocks like that. And um, they will also be able to finish reasonably quickly the old minimum time issue. Very much. Uh, David? All right. Well, Mary, thanks for your comments on the TEC. I won't pick that up again. Maybe I'll pick up the other question, the universal learning entitlement. So we read in with some detail the the interim report it felt like the perhaps there was a bit of confusion over what that might look like which is perfectly understandable at the at an interim report phase i just wondered whether since then there had been any in your mind any further thinking or, or clarity or progress towards what that might look like prior to the final report it's a good point and it's a clear criticism um yes it's it's much clearer i'm just struggling with do how much do I talk about? I think what I, I, I won't go into all the details, but to say I think we've landed appropriately in a clearly understandable spot where we're trying to do the best of demand driven while not some of the negative sides of demand driven. So I might leave it a bit cryptical there, but I think it's much clearer than it was in the interim or has to be because of the funding request. one from me, Mary. Um, people will always appeal for less big brother, as it were. Um, the community has a demand, though, for more accountability um, in, in public bodies and accountability of, of leadership. We see this in the corporate sector as well as the private. Um, the interim report did have two areas of focus under the heading of governance. I'm just wondering, um, how we reconcile um, the quest uh, and requirement of the community for um, greater accountability um, with the aspirations for less burdensome regulatory activity, amongst other things. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, and I think we, we, we possibly 
kicked off what was seen as more regulatory burden with the way we put our interim re our recommendations, our five recommendations in the interim report. So we've been more careful this time to examine everything with a, through the lens of um, sort of unintended regulatory burden. But I think those tensions do exist. So at the point where I wound up the panel meeting this morning, we were talking about data and metrics. And one of the issues is, for example, how do you make sure there's not a gigantic regulatory burden of extra data collection while we need more data and more appropriate data for accountability purposes? So how do you introduce any changes in a cost-efficient, time-efficient manner that aren't that are one off in, in the nature of the changing. So, we are talking, you know, things like our transition arrangements. How do you actually make sure that at, at a time when registry burden can get quite high in a big transition, how you actually keep it down? And how do you keep going back to what David asked about the Tertiary Education Commission? How do you make sure that that is not a great dead hand, but rather a body that encourages interaction with the system. So anything remotely like registry burden will be talked out first before it comes in. Now, we're now going to seek comments or questions. Have we got any volunteers to um, kickstart the process? Got one here and one over here. Um, thanks. Uh, hi, <coughs> pardon me. My name's uh, Ian Kimber. I'm an um, independent quality consultant. We heard um, this morning a metaphor about an educational train that had three carriages, early childhood schooling and universities. Arguably there's a fourth carriage, which is vocational education, or perhaps it's a separate train. <coughs> um, but certainly there's got to be connecting points. So my question is to, to Mary about what is the report and the final set of recommendations likely to say about that particular aspect of our educational train? Thanks very much, Ian. It, it's very heavy on talking about that. As a matter of fact, I would have thought the Minister would have used the third carriage as having uh, tertiary education and be a higher ed and bed. Um, which is where the review largely lands. And we talk a lot about the tertiary system. We were asked in one of our terms of reference to look at the interface between tertiary and BEP, but we've actually looked at it very extensively and looked at how the sectors don't become one sector, but it's one sector, two parts. It's sounding theological at this point, but um, it, we, we very much believe that the two, that vocational training and higher ed, we need to be able to move between the two very easily and we need to be able to bring the two together as we did in those institutes of applied technology here in New South Wales in ways to offer new courses to build with new skills areas on occasion. So it's a, there's a lot about that in the report as working tightly with IRE. And there's a lot about the infrastructure of things like skills passport, um, the APF reform, fixing uh, RPL, recognition, trial learning, and so on. I'll, I'll tell you the whole report of what we've done on this. Thanks for the question, Ian, and thanks, Mary. Next one, please. Sorry, this one here at the front first, please. Hi, um, my name's Theo. I'm a rural medical student with Charles Sturt as well. So I understand everything that Taylor has said. And I specifically related a lot to the relocating and all of the expenditure that comes with that and connecting with community. I'm just wondering in terms of with the whole panel, what have you considered um, making placements more accessible within communities so that we can, I understand, you know, you've got a relocate for some of that education, but being able to come back to your community for your placement, because I have not been able to do that, but I'd love to be able to do that, and I'd love to see a lot more students be able to do that in the future. Thanks. Can Thanks for the question. question. Over to you, Mary. Yeah, can I ask you a question? It's great. Why can't you do it at home? 
I mean, who said you? I mean, was placement at your in your hometown not offered? So I am originally from Barrel, um, and with the uh, the medical school I'm at, we do get to do our placements rurally, but it's been a real challenge to actually get those placements because of accessibility and um, yeah, it's it's been a real challenge. That's unfortunately not available for me, but and a lot of most of the students, you know, we all come from rural backgrounds, but. Unfortunately, a lot of those towns can't actually offer any places in their hospitals for us. Yeah, I see the problem with teaching hospitals. Yeah. Um, Taylor, you might want to comment. I mean, we do talk a lot about placement. The, that particular angle, I don't know that we've done. Let me take it on board. Um, obviously, it's place. This issue very well. Um, unpaid placements are a huge issue in itself, let alone where you do that placement can have a huge impact. And I'm a really strong believer that every single, pla every single student needs to do a placement somewhere out in the country, um, especially for those metro students who have never stepped foot an hour outside of town. It opens up the whole world to them. And would yeah, I totally agree with what, with what you've said. Um, like it would just be incredible if we could get more people out to those communities to fill those jobs because um, it would be such an amazing opportunity. We just need to make sure there's the support mechanisms and actually the systems to allow them to do those placements out there. Thank you. Um, I think there's one at the back first, is there? Hi, uh, my name is Alison. I'm handling the um, questions coming in from the virtual delegates. This one is uh, for Taylor. Uh, as a high school student, what particular challenges have you encountered or did you encounter studying online? And what are your thoughts on those challenges moving forward? Thank you very much. Um, I was lucky that I got to do those online subjects because without them I wouldn't have been able to apply for med. However, I think the biggest one is having support within your own school. So obviously if your teacher is in a nearby school three hours away and you're only meeting them um, on Zoom, say for an hour a week, um, having questions outside of that can be really tough and staying motivated as well, um, not having someone to, you know, to keep pushing you along, keep going, yep, you can do it, like almost there. Um, that was really hard. Also being online, I was the only student in my class doing um, chemistry and biology, so I was quite isolated um, in my school. Um, another challenge was, so I was lucky enough that my teacher from another school came to my school once a term to do practicals in the science lab um, to get those done. However, I'd love if those were um, able to be done more regularly so I could get those hands-on skills and yeah, hands-on learning. I think that's a huge aspect um, that we miss out with with online learning. So I think having a blended approach where possible, so doing hands-on and then online, meeting somewhere in the middle is super duper beneficial. Thank you. Perhaps one more question or comment. We might have two. From the floor, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Samuel Suresh. I'm from Western Sydney University. Um, I just want to say I'm very impressed with the commitment to keeping students at the center of all of this. But as we all know, students are one stakeholder in the process and there are more, there's more to it than just students. And so the question I have to ask is fairly simple and I'm sure everyone in the room has an answer to it, but it's one that students have and we often don't express. And it's the question of what is specifically university for? In, in one sense, it's a place to prepare graduates for the future of work and to contribute to society. To others, it's about making them people who can think critically. But um, yes, it's for students, but what is it doing with those students and for what? Um, very keen to hear whoever has something to say, thoughts. I think, I think we should give Mary first, first go. Mary? I think you've answered your own question, Samuel. Um, I think it's, it's all of the above. And we certainly talk about that while keeping students at the centre for all, for those all those purposes. So I think at that point I'll say, can I urge you then to read the report when it comes out? Maybe talk to your vice chancellor, who's had a big say in it as one of the panel members, one of the great contributors. 
and um, I hope we will have reflected that array of issues appropriately. Do you want to add, either of you? Yeah, I think um, what's uni university about, I think it's about equipping post high school students with the skills they need to thrive in the environment after high school, whether that's in life, work, socially, I think as long as you can, can succeed in life as well as your career, that's what it should be about as well. Yeah, and for me, university has always been about aspiration. <laughs> and different people will have dis different aspirations. I think our sector is diversity enough to be able to meet those. And let's not forget the civilising role of education. Um, one more, please, and then I'm going to close it. Last one. Thank you. Hello, Sally Mayo from the University of Melbourne. And just to continue the theme, originally from a tiny coal mining town in WA, um, we know a lot actually about the things that we need to do around placements for students from regional areas and other areas of equity and that's because we have the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education. How do you see research in other aspects of higher education such as providing the skills for the nation being funded? Mary, I think that's a full toss for you. Yes, I think it is. Um, sorry, can I get clear on the question? You asked about how do we fund skills education so people get appropriate skills. The question is how do we fund research other than that on equity? So research in higher education other than equity research. Yeah. So, yes, that's one area we haven't covered as, as yet in, in this morning's conversation. We look particularly at the current funding models and where, and in particular, examine the weaknesses. So, one of, at the moment, of course, as I said, there's about $12 billion um, expenditure by the higher education sector on research, of which about $4 billion, uh, I think I'll drive a bit more, just will, that comes from government in the form of national competitive grants and in the form of the block grants. And then the universities themselves contribute a very laudable eight odd million into the uh, into research funding. So what we want to do is make sure that continues that the government funds more and also that we deal with the issue of um, full funding. At the moment, as you know, national competitive grants are a contribution to the grant. How do we change that? And it's not going to happen over time because of the cost, but how would you change it over time to, to get out of that problem where everyone feels that there's the burden of match funding, we're ratcheting it, having to contribute more to get more. Um, we also look at the whole issue of use of research. And as I said in that earlier conversation, earlier speech, a bit of this, this hour, um, we need to actually, I think, really know is higher ed research being used as much as it could be, by, particularly by industry and by government, or how do we get more pull through and we've got a mechanism to examine that and reward that. That, that probably gives you a general, and, and also we've heard very strongly from the sector that there's been um, a lack of funding fairly much of sort of fundamental research, the basic strategic basic and on from there, and that that probably needs an appropriate boost. I, I'm trying very hard not to trip over myself here in telling you the whole story, but hopefully there's enough hints in what I've said. Mary, I'm going to, we're moving to the close of the session. I'm going to ask Taylor and David if they'd like to make a, a closing comment or question directed perhaps to Mary, and then I'll provide the last word to Mary. Um, my closing comment would be to the students in the room. So I think there's about 135 of you and I just want to say whether you're here on behalf of advocacy or representing your university, make sure that your vo voice is heard. Do everything in your power to try and make as much change as possible and make sure no one invalidates your experiences and what you've gone through as a student. Um, because I think there's so much power in that itself. Because um, imagine if like 
there's seven billion, a billion of us on this earth. Imagine if every single person said, oh, I'm just one person, I can't change anything. So please take that advice on board and yeah, use your voice. That would be what I have to say. Thank you. Well said. My comment is to uh, Mary and the Accord panel and everyone involved on the Ministerial Reference Group and other bodies. First of all, I think you were given a Herculean task, so well done so far, but I think just know that the sector is behind you. You know, we want to see uh, this review succeed. We want to see good practical outcomes. May this not be just another review that we talk about in 10 years' time, but may it be something that actually leads to practical outcomes and reforms in the sector. I'm an optimist, so I'm really hoping and believing that that will happen, and I think many in the room are in the same boat. So thank you for your work so far, and we look forward to the final report. Thanks, David. And final, and final thought to you, please, Mary. Thanks, Peter. Um, and thanks, David and Taylor, for those, those comments. Yes, I hope we do deliver what you want. But what I want to say now is a big thank you to all of you and, and to people across the sector and people outside the sector who are, if you like, stakeholders in it, industry groups, union groups, and so on. Um, it, it's been a great honour to be doing this review and we've been really enormously helped by the comments the submissions people who took the phone calls when we wanted to get specialist advice on issue people who came to workshops people who pointed out literature and good examples to us we were very very strongly supported in the process by people across the sector and as i said more widely and we're very very grateful to that particular shout out and thank you to peter the Peter, you've been as ever a good friend of the, you know, provided a lot of thoughtful comment through things and more generally to your colleagues across Texas. And, you know, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak late in the piece. Um, that's a good place to stop. And I'd just like to say thank you so much, Mary. We know you've got an impossible set of um, demands to, uh, to meet and to. Uh, and a juggle at the present time. So thanks very much for joining us and being so um, frank in your observations. Um, thank you to Taylor and to David uh, for enriching the, the, the session with your own commentary and experiences and questions. And uh, collectively, everyone, could we please thank Mary, Taylor and David. I'm, I'm probably in trouble because we've gone five or ten over, um, but the ne next session, which uh, will be led by Me Dr Mary Russell, our acting CEO, will start in about 20 minutes' time, so I'd ask you please to try and get back in that, in that uh, time frame. Thank you very much.